Let's listen to the chapter 2, page number 16. New Kings and Kingdoms Many new dynasties emerged after the 7th century. Map 1 shows the major ruling dynasties in different parts of the subcontinent between the 7th and the 12th centuries. On this page, a map of the subcontinent is shown. Map 1. Major Kingdoms, 7th to 12th centuries. On the left-hand side of this page, a question is being asked in a blue box. Locate the Gurjar, Pratihar, Rashtrakut, Pal, Chol and Chahamanas or Chauhans. Can you identify the present-day states over which they exercised control? Page 17 The emergence of new dynasties By the 7th century, there were big landlords or warrior chiefs in different regions of the subcontinent. Existing kings often acknowledged them as their subordinates or Samans. They were expected to bring gifts for their kings and overlords, be present at their courts and provide them with military support. As Samans gained power and wealth, they declared themselves to be Mahasamant, Mahamandaleshwar or the great lord of a circle or region and so on. Sometimes they asserted their independence from their overlords. One such instance was that of the Rashtrakut in the Deccan. Initially, they were subordinate to the Chalukyas of Karnataka. In the mid-8th century, Dantidurg, a Rashtrakut chief, overthrew his Chalukya overlord and performed a ritual called Hiranyagarbh, literally the golden womb. When this ritual was performed with the help of Brahmins, it was thought to lead to the rebirth of the sacrificer as a Kshatriya, even if he was not one by birth. In other cases, men from enterprising families used their military skills to carve out kingdoms. For instance, the Kadamba Mayur Sharman and Gurjar Pratihar Hari Chandra were Brahmins who gave up their traditional professions and took to arms, successfully establishing kingdoms in Karnataka and Rajasthan, respectively. On the right-hand top of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 1 Wall relief from Cave 15, Elora, showing Vishnu as Narsimha, the man-lion. It is a work of the Rashtrakut period. A question is being asked, written in the blue box. Do you think being born as a Kshatriya was important in order to become a ruler during this period? Administration in the Kingdoms Many of these new kings adopted high-sounding titles such as Maharaja Dhiraj, Great King, Overlord of Kings, Tribhuvan, Chakravartin, Lord of the Three Worlds, and so on. However, in spite of such claims, they often shared power with their Samans as well as with associations of peasants, traders, and Brahmins. Page 18 In each of these states, resources were obtained from the producers, that is, peasants, cattle keepers, artisans, who were often persuaded or compelled to surrender part of what they produced. Sometimes these were claimed as rent due to a lord who asserted that he owned the land. Revenue was also collected from traders. On this page, an important information is given regarding taxes in a pink box. 400 taxes the inscriptions of the Cholas who ruled in Tamil Nadu 
refer to more than 400 terms for different kinds of taxes. The most frequently mentioned tax is Vetti, taken not in cash but in the form of forced labour, and Kadamai or land revenue. There were also taxes on thatching the house, the use of a ladder to climb palm trees, assess on succession to family property, etc. Are any such taxes collected today? These resources were used to finance the king's establishment as well as for the construction of temples and forts. They were also used to fight wars, which in turn expected to lead to the acquisition of wealth in the form of plunder and access to land as well as trade routes. The functionaries for collecting revenue were generally recruited from influential families and positions were often hereditary. This was true about the army as well. In many cases, close relatives of the king held these positions. On the left-hand side of this page, a question is being asked, written in a blue box. In what ways was this form of administration different from the present-day system? Prashastis and Land Grants Prashastis contain details that may not be literally true, but they tell us how rulers wanted to depict themselves as valiant, victorious warriors, for example. These were composed by learned Brahmins who occasionally helped in the administration. Page 19 The Achievements of Nagabhatt Many rulers described their achievements in Prashastis. You read about the Prashasti of Gupta ruler Samudra Gupta last year. One Prashasti, written in Sanskrit and found in Gwalior, Madhya Pradesh, describes the exploits of Nagabhatta, a Pratihar king, as follows. The kings of Andhra, Sandhav or Sindh, Vidarbh, part of Maharashtra, and Kalinga, part of Odisha, fell before him even as he was a prince. He won a victory over Chakra Yuddha the ruler of Kannauj. He defeated the king of Vang, part of Bengal, Anarth, part of Gujarat, Malwa, part of Madhya Pradesh, Kirat, forest peoples, Turushk, or Turks, Vats, Matsya, both kingdoms in North India. Kings often rewarded Brahmins by grants of land. These were recorded on copper plates, which were given to those who received the land. On the right-hand side, an important question is being asked, written in a blue box. Also see if you can find some of the areas mentioned in the inscription on map 1. Other rulers made similar claims as well. Why do you think they made these claims? On the bottom of this page, some copper plates are shown. Figure 2. This is a set of copper plates recording a grant of land made by a ruler in the 9th century, written partly in Sanskrit and partly in Tamil. The ring holding the plates together is secured with the royal seal to indicate that this is an authentic document. Page 20. What was given with the land? This is the part of the Tamil section of a land grant given by the Cholas. We have demarcated the boundaries of the land by making earthen embankments as well as by planting thorny bushes. This is what the land contains. Fruit-bearing trees, water, land, gardens and orchards, trees, wells, open spaces, pasture land, a village, ant hills, platforms, canals, ditches, rivers, silt-laden land, tanks, granaries, fish ponds, 
bee hives and deep lakes. He who receives the land can collect taxes from it. He can collect the taxes imposed by judicial officers as fines. The tax on beetle leaves, that on woven cloth as well as on vehicles. He can build large rooms with upper stories made of baked bricks. He can get large and small wells dug. He can plant trees and thorny bushes. If necessary, he can get canals constructed for irrigation. He should ensure that water is not wasted and that embankments are built. A question is now being asked. List all the possible sources of irrigation mentioned in the inscription and discuss how these might have been used. Unusual for the 12th century was a long Sanskrit poem containing the history of kings who ruled over Kashmir. It was composed by an author named Kalahan. He used a variety of sources including inscriptions, documents, eyewitness accounts and earlier histories to write his account. Unlike the writers of Prashastis, he was often critical about rulers and their policies. Warfare for Wealth You may have noticed that each of these ruling dynasties was based in a specific region. At the same time, they tried to control other areas. One particularly prized area was the city of Kannauj in the Ganga Valley. Page 21 For centuries, rulers belonging to the Gurjar Pratihar, Rashtrakut and Pal dynasties fought for control over Kannauj because there were three parties in this long-drawn conflict. Historians often describe it as the tripartite struggle. On the right-hand side of this page, a question is being asked, written in a blue box. Look at map 1 and suggest reasons why these rulers wanted to control Kannauj and the Ganga Valley. As we will see from page number 62 to 66, rulers also tried to demonstrate their power and resources by building large temples. So, when they attacked another's kingdoms, they often chose to target temples, which were sometimes extremely rich. You will read more about this in chapter 5. In the middle of the right-hand side of this page, an important information is written. Sultan, an Arabic term meaning ruler. One of the best known of such rulers is Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni, Afghanistan. He ruled from 997 to 1030 and extended control over parts of Central Asia, Iran and northwestern part of the subcontinent. He raided the subcontinent almost every year. His targets were wealthy temples, including that of Somnath, Gujarat. Much of the wealth Mahmud carried away was used to create a splendid capital city at Ghazni. Sultan Mahmud was also interested in finding out more about the people he conquered and entrusted a scholar named Al-Biruni to write an account of the subcontinent. This Arabic work known as Kitabul Hind remains an important source for historians. He consulted Sanskrit scholars to prepare this account. Other kings who engaged in warfare included the Chahmans, later known as the Chauhans, who ruled over the region around Delhi and Ajmer. They attempted to expand their control to the west and the east, where they were opposed by the Chalukyas of Gujarat and the Gaharwals of western Uttar Pradesh. The best known Chahamana ruler was Prithviraj III, who ruled from 1168 to 1192, who defeated an Afghan ruler named Sultan Muhammad Ghori in 1191, but lost to him the very next year in 1192. On the bottom right of this page, 
an important information is written and a question is being asked in a blue box. Look at map 1 again and discuss why the Chahamanas may have wanted to expand their territories. Page 22 A closer look, the Cholas. On this page, a map is being shown. Map 2 The Chola Kingdom and its neighbors. From Urayur to Tanjavur. How did the Cholas rise to power? A minor chiefly family known as the Muttariyar held power in Kaveri Delta. They were subordinate to the Pallav kings of Kanchipuram, Vijayalai, who belonged to the ancient chiefly family of the Cholas from Urayur, captured the delta from the Mutarriyar in the middle of the 9th century. He built the town of Tanjavur and a temple for goddess Nishambasudini there. The successors of Vijayalai conquered neighboring regions and the kingdom grew in size and power. The Pandayan and Pallava territories of the south and north were made part of this kingdom. Page 23 Raj Raj I, considered the most powerful Chola ruler, became king in 985 and expanded control over most of these areas. He also reorganized the administration of the empire. Raj Raja's son, Rajendra I, continued his policies and even raided the Ganga Valley, Sri Lanka and countries of Southeast Asia developing a navy for these expeditions. Splendid temples and bronze sculpture. The big temples of Tanjavur and Gangai Kond Cholapuram, built by Raj Raja and Rajendra, are architectural and sculptural marvels. Chola temples often became the nuclei of settlements which grew around them. These were centers of craft production. Temples were also endowed with land by rulers as well as by others. In the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 3 The temple at Gangai Kond Cholapuram. Notice the way in which the roof tapers. Also look at the elaborate stone sculptures used to decorate the outer walls. Page 24 The produce of this land went into maintaining all the specialists who worked at the temple and very often lived near it. Priests, garland makers, cooks, sweepers, musicians, dancers, etc. In other words, temples were not only places of worship, they were the hub of economic, social and cultural life as well. Amongst the crafts associated with temples, the making of bronze images was the most distinctive. Chola bronze images are considered amongst the finest in the world. While most images were of deities, sometimes images were made of devotees as well. Agriculture and Irrigation Many of the achievements of the Cholas were made possible through new developments in agriculture. Look at map 2 again. Notice that the river Kaveri branches off into several small channels before emptying into the Bay of Bengal. These channels overflow frequently, depositing fertile soil on their banks. Water from the channels also provides the necessary moisture for agriculture, particularly the cultivation of rice. Although agriculture had developed earlier in other parts of Tamil Nadu, it was only from the 5th or 6th century that this area was opened up for large-scale cultivation. Forests had to be cleared in some regions. Land had to be leveled in other areas. In the Delta region, embankments had to be built to prevent flooding and canals had to be constructed to carry water to the fields. In many areas, two crops were grown in a year. On this page, a picture is shown. Figure 4 A Chola bronze sculpture. Notice how carefully it is decorated. 
To find out how these images were made, see Chapter 6. Page 25 On the top of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 5 A 9th century sluice gate in Tamil Nadu. It regulated the outflow of water from a tank into the channels that irrigated the fields. A sluice gate is traditionally a wood or metal barrier which is commonly used to control water levels and flow rates in rivers and canals. In many cases, it was necessary to water crops artificially. A variety of methods were used for irrigation. In some areas, wells were dug. In other places, huge tanks were constructed to collect rain water. Remember that irrigation works require planning, organizing labor and resources, maintaining these works and deciding on how water is to be shared. Most of the new rulers, as well as people living in villages, took an active interest in these activities. The Administration of the Empire how was the administration organized? Settlements of peasants, known as Ur, became prosperous with the spread of irrigation agriculture. Groups of such villages formed larger units called Nadu. The village council and the Nadu performed several administrative functions, including dispensing justice and collecting taxes. Rich peasants of the Villal caste exercised considerable control over the affairs of the Nadu under the supervision of the central Chola government. The Chola kings gave some rich landowners titles like Muveen the Velan, a Velan or peasant serving three kings, Arayar or chief, etc. as markers of respect and entrusted them with important offices of the state at the center. Page 26. On top of this page, some important information is shared in a pink box. Types of Land Chola inscriptions mention several categories of land. Villan Vagai Brahmadeya Land gifted to Brahmans Shalabhog Land for the maintenance of a school. Devadan Tirun Matukkani, land gifted to temples. Pallichandam, land donated to Jain institutions. We have seen that Brahmans often received land grants and Brahmadeya. As a result, a large number of Brahman settlements emerged in the Kaveri Valley as in other parts of South India. Each Brahmadeya was looked after by an assembly or sabha of prominent Brahman landlords. These assemblies worked very efficiently. Their decisions were recorded in detail in inscriptions, often on the stone walls of temples. Associations of traders, known as Nagarams, also occasionally performed administrative functions in towns. Inscriptions from Uttar Merur in Chingalput district, Tamil Nadu, provide details of the way in which the Sabha was organized. The Sabha had separate committees to look after irrigation works, gardens, temples, etc. Names of those eligible to be members of these committees were written on small tickets of palm leaf. These tickets were put into an earthenware pot from which a young boy was asked to take out the tickets, one by one for each committee. Page 27 Inscriptions and Texts Who could be a member of a sabha? The Uttar Merur inscription lays down, All those who wish to become members of the sabha should be owners of land from which land revenue is collected. They should have their own homes. They should be between 35 to 70 years of age. 
they should have knowledge of the Vedas. They should be well versed in administrative matters and honest. If anyone has been a member of any committee in the last three years, he cannot become a member of another committee. Anyone who has not submitted his accounts and those of his relatives cannot contest the elections. While inscriptions tell us about the kings and powerful men, here is an excerpt from the Periya Puranam, a 12th century Tamil work, which informs us about the lives of ordinary men and women. On the outskirts of Adanur was a small hamlet of Pulayas, a name used for social group considered outcasts by Brahmans and Villals. Studded with small huts under old thatches and inhabited by agrarian labour engaged in menial occupations. In the thresholds of the huts, covered with strips of leather, little chickens moved about in groups. Dark children who wore bracelets of black iron were prancing about, carrying little puppies. In the shade of the Marudu or Arjuna trees, a female labourer put her baby to sleep on a sheet of leather. There were mango trees from whose branches drums were hanging and under the coconut palms, in little hollows of the ground, tiny-headed bitches lay after whelping. The red-crested cocks crowed before dawn, calling the brawny pulayar, plural, to their day's work, and by day, under the shade of the kanji tree, spread the voice of the wavy-haired pulaya women, singing as they were husking paddy. On the right-hand side of this page, some questions have been asked, written in two blue boxes. Do you think women participated in these assemblies? In your view, are lotteries useful in choosing members of committees? Were there any Brahmans in this hamlet? Describe all the activities that were taking place in the village. Why do you think temple inscriptions Ignore these activities. Page 28 On top of this page, some important information is provided about the Chinese Tang dynasty in a blue box. China under the Tang dynasty In China, an empire was established under the Tang dynasty which remained in power for about 300 years, from the 7th to the 10th centuries. Its capital, Xi'an, was one of the largest cities in the world, visited by Turks, Iranians, Indians, Japanese and Koreans. The Tang Empire was administered by a bureaucracy recruited through an examination which was open to all who wished to appear for it. This system of selecting officials remained in place with some changes till 1911. In what ways was this system different from those prevalent in the Indian subcontinent? Imagine, you are present in an election for a sabha. Describe what you see and hear. Let's recall. 1. Match the following. Gurjar Pratihar Rashtrakoot Pal, Chol, Western Deccan, Bengal, Gujarat and Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu. 2. Who were the parties involved in the tripartite struggle? 3. What were the qualifications necessary to become a member of a committee of the Sabha in the Chol Empire? 4. What were the two major cities under the control of Chahamanas? Page 29 Let's understand. 5. How did the Rashtrakut became powerful? 6. What did the new dynasties do to gain acceptance? 7. What kind of irrigation works were developed in the Tamil region? 8. 
what were the activities associated with the Chola temples. Let's discuss. 9. Look at map 1 once more and find out whether there were any kingdoms in the state in which you live. 10. Contrast the elections in Uttar Merur with present-day panchayat elections. Let's do. 11. Compare the temple shown in this chapter with any present-day temple in your neighborhood, highlighting any similarities and differences that you notice. 12. Find out more about taxes that are collected at present. Are these in cash, kind or labor services? Keywords Samant Temple Nadu Sabha The chapter 2 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here.